expert, the Academy for Eating Disorders, um, as well as a longtime colleague of Dr. Eddy. And I'm also, um, I have the fortune of being your moderator this morning. So if you have any questions or concerns about the webinar, um, hopefully you won't have any concerns, but any questions, <laughs> please feel free to reach out directly to uh, Don Gannon, the Deputy Executive Director at AD Headquarters. Uh, you can email her at dgannon, so D-G-A-N-N-O-N, -N -N, at aedweb.org, uh, or you can reach her by phone by dialing 703-234-4125 in the U.S., and by adding a plus one if you're calling from outside the U.S. So I just wanted to go over a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Um, all participants are muted with the exception of Dr. Eddie and me. Uh, the webinar is scheduled for 90 minutes and it is being recorded. Um, for anyone who's not able to attend today um, live, it will be posted on the AED website shortly thereafter um, as a benefit for AED members to download at their convenience. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you can get access to this wonderful webinar by Dr. <laughs> Eddie. In just a few minutes, um, Dr. Eddie will begin her presentation. And then after that, we're going to do a Q&A session um, inviting questions from the audience. Um, I might also have some questions for you as well. Um, and so please feel free to submit your questions to me during the presentation using the text box on the right hand side of your screen. So if you have questions about anything presented on the slides or if it inspires any ideas that you want to discuss later, please go ahead and submit them. And then I'll read them to her when the question portion of the webinar begins. So Dr. Eddie, let's start by checking your volume quickly. Can you just say a few words? And if a couple of the participants can let me know if you can hear her clearly by sending a message in the text box that I just mentioned, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks, Jenny. Yes, this is Cameron. I hope that you can hear me. Well, we see typing. This Ooh. is a good sign. Wonderful. Okay, great. So we got a message that you can be heard perfectly. That's great. So thank you so much. Um, all right, so we appreciate everyone letting us know that you can hear her loud and clear. Um, so I'd like to now move to introducing my longtime colleague, Dr. Eddy. So for those of you who don't know, um, Dr. Eddy is the co-director of the Mass General Hospital Eating Disorder Clinical and Research Program, as well as an associate professor of psychology at Harvard Medical School. Um, Dr. Eddy specializes in the assessment and treatment of child and adolescent eating disorders, although as you'll see today, she's also quite knowledgeable about adults. Um, she received her undergrad degree from Columbia University, uh, where she also worked at a fashion magazine <laughs> earlier in her career, um, and a PhD in clinical psychology from Boston University, and completed her pre-doctoral internship in the University of Chicago Medical Center and her postdoctoral training right here at Mass General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Um, she practices in peers and supported therapies and trains lots of our trainees in those as well. She uses cognitive behavioral therapy and family-based treatments um, for patients all across the age spectrum. And along with our team, Dr. Eddie has developed a novel cognitive behavior therapy for avoidant restrictive um, food intake disorder. Um, and that will be published in a forthcoming book by Cambridge University Press. Just a bit more about Dr. Eddy, if you aren't already impressed. She's the author of 100 published research papers and book chapters, um, over 100. And her program of research focuses on diagnostic classification, the neurological basis of eating disorders, and longitudinal outcomes, which will be the topic of her presentation today. Um, she's the principal investigator of a 22-year longitudinal outcome study um, that she'll be sharing quite a bit more about. She's also a fellow of the Academy for Eating Disorders and a member of the Eating Disorder Research Society, and her research is well supported through many private foundations as well as the National Institute of Mental Health. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Eddy. Thanks so much, Jenny, for that lovely introduction. So um, it's nice to have people here, and you know, I really am grateful to the Academy for Eating Disorders for inviting me to present. Um, I've been involved in the longitudinal study of eating disorders um, really for actually about 20 years, so it's pretty exciting for me to have this privilege of uh, getting to share some of our work. Um, so my title, uh, my talk title is Eating Disorder Recovery and Long-Term Outcomes. So our patients will come to us, you know, asking, will I ever get better? Those are the kinds of questions that we hear both from patients themselves as well as from family members who wonder, you know, who may have heard eating disorders described as chronic illnesses, 
who may believe that their eating disorder is a life sentence or even in a worst case scenario as a death sentence. At Massachusetts General Hospital, uh, we initiated a longitudinal study of eating disorders in 1987. So this was a little bit before I joined the group. Um, <laughs> David Herzog, uh, who was a former colleague of ours, started this study in 1987 as a naturalistic study of 246 treatment-seeking women uh, who presented at the time with dsm 3 are uh, anorexia nervosa or bulimia nervosa. At the time, this was the first study of its kind where, uh, you know, bulimia was a relatively new diagnosis, and we were just trying to learn more about the course and outcome of these illnesses. In this pretty comprehensive study, women were interviewed really regularly. So they were interviewed about every six to 12 months and for a median of nine and a half years. In the data that I'll show, show to you today, they were then re-interviewed for a one-time follow-up at a median of 22 years. And I'll, I'll show you a little bit more about the assessment process. But just to walk you through it, um, there had been other studies out there on the course and outcome of inpatients with eating disorders, but ours was a community-based treatment-seeking sample. So individuals seeking treatment in the community through um, outpatient centers largely, um, but also some of them had received and were receiving inpatient care. In terms of the assessment timeline, um, the initial wave of data collection started in 1987, between 1987 and 1991, meaning that that's when the women were initially recruited into the study. They then were regularly interviewed every six to 12 months um, for a mean of 9.1 years. So between 1987 and 2001, folks were interviewed very regularly. Uh, this was an NIMH funded study during that window of time. Um, and then around 2001, um, the idea of doing a naturalistic follow-up study um, was more challenging to get funded. And so um, we took a pause, uh, and at the time we continued to be in touch with our participants, and then we recontacted and re-interviewed folks um, for wave two, which was conducted between 2001 and 2013 at a mean of 22.1 years follow-up. So just to get a sense of this graph, um, what you can see is that people were interviewed very regularly every six to 12 months for the first nine years of data collection, and then they were interviewed once at wave two, where data were gathered for a full year um, at 22 years. We used a number of different assessment measures, uh, focusing mostly on clinical interview. So at both waves, or I should say over waves one and then again at wave two, we used the longitudinal interval follow-up evaluation eating disorder version, the LIFE E2. This is a very comprehensive semi-structured interview that we're very glad to share with people who might be interested or who might be interested in using it in research or clinical, um, clinical practice. It's an interview that assesses on a weekly basis symptoms, eating disorder symptoms, comorbidity, and in the data that I'll share with you today, we focused on depression and substance use disorders. It also assesses treatment participation. And then it assesses psychosocial functioning using a measure called the RIFT. It's the LIFE RIFT. Um, and RIFT stands for the Range of Imp uh, Impaired Functioning Tool. Um, and so this interview, while administered every 6 to 12 months, asks patients or participants to retrospectively recall things that have been happening week to week over the past either six to 12 months. We did this during the first nine years of the study and then again at 22 years. And at 22 years, folks were asked to recall just the last 12 months rather than of course the intervening 15 or so years, which we wouldn't expect people to be able to recall too precisely. At wave two, in addition to doing the life eat two, we also administered two self-report questionnaires, the Eating Disorder Examination Questionnaire, and then the WHO Quality of Life, the World Health Organization Quality of Life breath measure. 
just to give you a sense of the clinical sample when they presented, um, again, between 1987 and 1991. Um, these were folks who were around 24, 25 years old. Um, there were 51 folks with restricting type anorexia, 85 with the binge purge type anorexia, and 110 with bulimia nervosa. Uh, a small portion of those with bulimia nervosa also had a history of anorexia nervosa, but at the time that they presented, they were at a normal weight. You can see that uh, even when they came into our study, um, they'd been ill for an average of nearly seven years, um, and that their eating disorder was variably onsetting, um, but the, you know, in, in late adolescence. Um, comorbidity was high in the sample, um, but pretty similar to what's been reported in other studies. Um, major depression was a very common comorbidity. Again, I want to emphasize that this is a treatment-seeking sample. So in our sample, you know, in the late 1980s, folks were coming in for treatment, um, and the kind of treatment that they were getting uh, may be quite different from what we're uh, delivering today. Certainly some folks were getting cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, it's probably less likely that people are getting family-based treatment, but people were getting a range of different kinds of outpatient treatment, and certainly people were getting a fair number, a uh, fair amount of inpatient and residential care as well. Um, the people were coming into our study as outpatients, um, and they were coming in both the Mass General Hospital as well as Boston area facilities. Uh, the women uh, who had anorexia nervosa during the course of the study received more inpatient treatment than those with bulimia nervosa, as you might expect. And um, the, uh, Dr. Pam Keel has reported this, and I am sorry for not including the reference at the bottom of the page. I'll do that when we upload it. Um, but uh, Dr. Keel has also reported that symptom severity during um, any given year predicted treatment utilization in our sample in the following year. So this is a pretty well-treated sample. Um, but what feels important to say is that uh, the types of treatment that people were getting were really widely variable um, and, uh, and were also related to how uh, severe, severe their eating disorder was. So we asked four overarching questions, and these are the ones that I'll share with you today. The first was, how common is long-term recovery? Second, how or what predicts long-term recovery? Um, and I'll move that piece. Okay. And then the third is how does one recover? And finally, how can we as clinicians and researchers do better by our patients? So how common is long-term recovery? In anorexia nervosa, for the first time, DSM-5 now does define partial and full remission for anorexia as well as for bulimia nervosa. Um, as, you, as you probably know, there was a lot of work that went into the DSM-5 revisions. Um, however, uh, in spite of most things being strongly empirically based, it seems like there were, there were less data available for supporting definitions of partial or full remission. Um, in some ways, they make intuitive sense, the idea that for partial remission for both anorexia and bulimia, um, some of the criteria are still met, but most of them are not. Um, in anorexia, that means being at a normal weight or no longer at a low weight, um, but perhaps still having intense fear of gaining weight or disturbances in self-perception of weight and shape. Um, in bulimia, again, it says some, but not all of the criteria are met for a sustained period of time for partial remission. And then for both illnesses, for full remission, they're asking for none of the criteria to have been met for a sustained period of time. The terms are a bit vague, um, and so I'll share with you more about how we operationalized um, these definitions. And because, of course, as you remember, we conducted these uh, follow-ups between 2011 and 2013, which was right before the DSM-5 came out. Um, so we were, we were working based on um, what seemed to make sense to us and based on consensus of a number of clinicians and having reviewed the field. Um, so how did we define recovery? Well, we defined it based on being behavior-free, um, having minimal cognitions about weight and shape or fat phobia, and not being at a low weight. So in some ways, uh, our definition perhaps falls between 
um, partial and full recovery from DSM-5 definitions, um, but I thought I would share with you some, uh, some example presentations. So example presentations from folks in our longitudinal sample who were recovered at long-term follow-up for one full year, and I guess that's the one piece I'll go back to as well. So how did we define recovery? We defined it behavior-free, not at a low weight, and minimal cognitions for a full year. So um, to give you a few examples, one woman shared, um, I don't feel that I have an eating disorder anymore. I don't worry about what I eat. I eat until I feel satiated. I exercise moderately. And overall, I don't think about food like I once did. In general, I feel accepting and I feel healthy and accepting of my body. She was like a pretty clean example of full recovery. The second person, a second person said, I consider my eating disorder to be pretty much gone. I do still worry about my body shape, and I also use food sometimes for comfort, but never in a way that's out of control anymore. A third person said, I have a young daughter and my eating health has been very good, aside from working mother exhaustion. My priorities have shifted. Motherhood has helped in my confidence and well-being. I'm certainly more accepting of myself, of who I am, and of what I look like. I could not imagine starving myself again. But having said that, it is easy for me to skip a meal if there isn't time, you know, between juggling work and parenting. Sometimes I would rather not eat versus eat in the car or on the run. So this is a person who was at a healthy weight, denied any eating disorder behaviors, including um, restricting her eating. Um, and at the same time, it sounds like body image may still be something that is important to her. And then the fourth person says, I don't consider myself to have an eating disorder anymore. I try to eat and exercise to maintain good health. And for the most part, I'm successful. I've maintained a steady body weight throughout my 30s and 40s. However, I still have that nagging feeling that maybe I could be a bit healthier. And by healthier, I guess I mean thinner, because my weight is healthy. Intellectually, I know body weight and shape does not define my importance, but occasionally I fall into the trap. If I was thinner, I would be better. I thought it would be important to share some of these examples of recovery to help everybody picture a little bit more about what we're talking about. Defining recovery in the field of eating disorders is very challenging. Um, particularly when um, some weight and shape concerns seem to be normative um, in, our, in our world. Um, so we defined it based on uh, behavioral remission, as well as um, having cognitions that we, we perceive to be within the normal range. Now I'm sharing with you some outcome data. So the first slide here recovery, presents recovery at nine years. What you can see is that by nine years of follow-up, about 31% of our individuals who presented with initial diagnoses of anorexia nervosa had fully recovered, meaning they'd had the full year of remission. Um, more than two-thirds, 68% of individuals with an initial diagnoses of bulimia nervosa had recovered. So in some ways, this fits with the clinical impression that individuals with anorexia nervosa may be more treatment resistant, may have more chronic illnesses, whereas individuals with bulimia nervosa may be quicker to remit in terms of their symptoms. This represents what happened over the course of the first nine years of the study. The story really changes by 22 years. So by 22 years of follow-up, the individuals with anorexia nervosa had caught up. So by long-term follow-up, nearly two-thirds of individuals with anorexia nervosa and a stable percent, 68 percent, of those with bulimia nervosa had recovered. I like to share this, um, again, because I think that it really does counter what a lot of people expect. Much of what's been written in the literature is that roughly 50 percent of individuals with eating disorders will fully recover. Our data show that by 22 years follow-up, actually more than that, so roughly two-thirds of individuals with anorexia nervosa or bulimia nervosa will fully recover. Oh, sorry about the slides. It looks like some of the um, formatting is a little bit off, so I apologize for that. Uh, in individuals who are recovered, what you can see is that eating disorder psychopathology is in the normal range. 
Um, what I'm sharing with you here are the long-term data. So this is at 22 years. You can see that the recovery for individuals who, uh, excuse me, that the scores for individuals who had recovered from anorexia nervosa, um, as well as those who'd recovered from bulimia nervosa, were within the normal range in recovery. And again, differed from um, the folks who had not recovered from either of these eating disorders. Um, for individuals who had fully recovered, comorbidity is often resolved as well. These data come from, um, so again, from the longitudinal study, but from one of our uh, research coordinators who will be presenting these data uh, at ICD next year. We found that um, recovery from anorexia and recovery from bulimia really did coincide as well with recovery from major depression as well as with substance use disorders. And then finally, their quality of life was also much better in folks who had recovered. So what's challenging is the assessment of quality of life. We use the World Health Organization Quality of Life Graph measure, which is a nice self-report measure of quality of life. Um, it assesses overall quality of life via two questions. You can see down below, how would you rate your quality of life and how satisfied are you with your health? And then it measures it across four domains. Physical, which is physical health, physical pain prevents you from. Psychological, how much do you enjoy life? Social, how satisfied are you with your relationships and environment? Um, how comfortable you, are you safety-wise, finance-wise, and how much are you enjoying leisure activities? The challenge is that with eating disorders, um, folks in some ways may have uh, accommodated to their eating disorder. Um, and what you can see is that uh, although there are differences, particularly in anorexia, between the recovered and not recovered folks across these indices of uh, quality of life, um, the differences you know, numerically are not that great. And what this may mean is either that folks with eating disorders um, their quality of life you know, maybe has actually improved over time, um, that they've accommodated to having an eating disorder, or perhaps also that this measure is not the best one of quality of life in eating disorders. Um, I'm, I'll share a little bit more in just a moment about quality of life in folks with more chronic illnesses. I also wanted to share that at 22 years, most of the folks who recover have a BMI that is in the normal range. As all of us who sit with our patients with eating disorders know, they worry quite a bit that when they start gaining weight or when they stop their symptoms, their weight will go up, go up, go up in a way that really becomes out of control. What we know from our longitudinal data is that this actually isn't what the case is. For most of our individuals, their BMI will end up in the normal range, um, and only a small minority um, of individuals with anorexia nervosa will, um, in our sample, end up in the overweight or obese category. In individuals with bulimia nervosa as well, while their weight is in the normal range, um, about a third will be in the overweight or obese range. Um, and again, this is less than you know, the roughly two thirds in the general population. But the more sobering side, of course, is that not everyone will recover. So our data show that roughly two thirds will achieve recovery by 22 years, but roughly one third will not. Um, the standardized mortality ratio in our sample is high. Um, the, uh, our data, both from our own data as well as from a meta-analysis that we published um, in 2014, demonstrate that the standardized mortality ratio for anorexia nervosa is roughly 5.2 suggesting that women with anorexia nervosa are five times more likely to die by their illness than age-matched con con controls. Um, this SMR, the standardized mortality ratio for suicide, is even greater. It's been reported as even higher, um, but when we did a meta-analysis, what we found was that it was at about 18, suggesting that women with anorexia nervosa in particular are 18 times more likely to die by suicide. What I will also share is that death by suicide, um, both in our sample and outside of our sample, um, is often via methods that are quite likely to be lethal. So individuals with anorexia nervosa accumulate a basically lifetime practice of uh, enduring pain. They're starving all the time. 
and this may um, you know, be a Tom, Thomas Joyner's model of um, acquired capability for suicide, may demonstrate um, that they have enormous practice of being in pain. Um, and indeed, they, in our sample, um, four of these patients from Jill Holm Genoma's paper come from our, our uh, longitudinal study sample, and the other five come from another sample. Um, but what you can see here is that their methods of suicide um, are ones that were quite likely to be fatal. What is it that predicts long-term recovery? So first and foremost, early recovery increases the likelihood of long-term recovery. What I am showing you here are on uh, column one are wave one recovery status um, cross tabs with wave two recovery status. What you can see is that in individuals with anorexia nervosa, if you were recovered at wave one, if you had achieved recovery during the first wave of the study, the first nine years of the study, you were extremely likely to be recovered um, at wave two. Um, just 10% of those who had recovered over the first nine years were not recovered at wave two if you had anorexia nervosa. Um, an additional 50% of those who were not recovered at wave one with anorexia nervosa were then recovered by wave two with anorexia nervosa. If you had recovered from bulimia nervosa over the first wave of the study, um, you were also highly likely to be recovered at wave two. And just 20% of those with bulimia nervosa who recovered over the first wave of the study were not recovered at wave two. And I will note also that an additional 40% of those who had not recovered from bulimia at wave one were then recovered or proceeded to recover. Um, by wave two. This seems to be particularly true in anorexia nervosa, where early recovery, um, recovering during wave one, even for 13 weeks, significantly increased the odds of full recovery by wave two. What we found was that if you'd recovered for a full year during wave one, you were 10 times more likely to be fully recovered from anorexia nervosa at wave two. If you'd recovered for half a year, for 26 weeks, you were six times more likely to be recovered at wave two. And if you'd recovered even just for 13 weeks during the first week of, uh, during the first year of this, during the first wave of the study, sorry, you were um, seven times more likely to be recovered by wave two. And what I feel like is the take home message from this piece is that in anorexia nervosa in particular, early recovery um, any kind of early experience with recovery bodes well. For folks who may be ambivalent about recovery or for folks who may think, you know, they need to be um, into, they need to be coming into treatment for themselves or they need to be going into a higher level of care for themselves, um, I would counter that and say, actually, any window of time where you've been recovered, where your weight is at a normal range, um, that that will bode well for the idea that you will be well in the long term. Additional predictors of outcome um, from our data suggest that um, uh, for anorexia nervosa for restricting type, um, having major depression at intake was something that actually um, uh, increased the likelihood of a more persistent eating disorder. For bulimia nervosa and for uh, binge purge type anorexia, anorexia nervosa, Having extreme symptoms, a uh, longer duration of extreme symptoms during the course of the study increased your risk of having a persistent illness at long-term follow-up. In binge purge type anorexia as well, um, being older at intake, perhaps also having a longer duration of illness, was something that um, increased likelihood of um, being ill at long-term follow-up. And one other thing that was protective in a binge purge type illness was having a higher BMI. In ANBP, having a higher BMI at the um, intake into the study was something that actually was protective. It increased your likelihood of being recovered over time. By contrast, I wanna share some predictors of poor outcome. Predictors of mortality in our sample included duration of illness. Um, having a longer duration of illness, perhaps intuitively, increased risk of mortality. 
Um, the other two that feel quite important to assess for are percent of time um, with having an alcohol use disorder. So we know that prospective alcohol use increases in alcohol use disorder, increases risk of mortality, particularly in anorexia nervosa. Percent of weeks at a low body mass index also at increased risk um, for mortality in anorexia. And then finally, social adjustment or social functioning at the last visit of our study, meaning at the end of wave one, predicted poorer outcome and mortality um, at 22 years or by 22 years of follow up. Social adjustment and social functioning, you know, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, can be more challenging for folks to report and for um, us to assess in terms of quality of life. In our patients, what we were looking at were poor relationships poor functioning at work and at school, and less overall life satisfaction. These were all things that predicted um, mortality in our sample, and they were also more poor in the folks with a much more persistent chronic illness, particularly chronic ALN. So the third question that we ask is, how does one actually recover? And I'm going to share with you some data um, demonstrating the course of illness for our patients. The first three slides that I'll share with you, um, some of you might have seen these before, um, these depict the longitudinal course of illness for patients with restricting type AN, then binge purge type AN, and then bulimia. The first slide shows you the, the course of restricting type AN. Just to orient you to this picture, um, the uh, x-axis shows you time, so this is years in the study, this is the first full seven years of the study. And the y-axis is actually um, represents participants. And what you're seeing here is that there are 40 rows for 40 patients or participants with restricting type anorexia nervosa. You can see that the colors change over time as you move from left to light, right in the slide. And what you're seeing here is that everybody comes in with the diagnosis of restricting type AN, but over the time in the study, their diagnosis changes as their symptoms change. Many of them cross over to binge purge type illness. Um, either to uh, anorexia nervosa binge purge type illness or to bulimia nervosa. But what I want to focus on is actually trans, uh, uh, transition to the TEAL, the partial recovery, um, and then full recovery. Um, the definitions that we used here are uh, slightly different in that um, even if people were uh, doing better for an eight-week window of time, they moved into a partial recovery state. Um, but the point that I want you to be looking at is that the progress um, from full, full uh, eating disorder to the teal, to the green, um, and then on to full recovery. So that in general, kind of by definition, people usually do not move directly from a full threshold illness to a fully recovered state. And that for most of our patients with restricting type illnesses, they're moving to a partially recovered state. The same is true for our patients with um, anorexia nervosa binge purge type. And then the same will be true for bulimia as well. This um, slide depicts the course for ANDP, and what you can see here is that there are 48 rows depicting the course of individuals with binge purge type AN, and again, there's even more movement here. So there's a fair amount of movement back to restricting type AN, from a binge purge type AN to restricting type AN, but there's also more movement to bulimia nervosa, um, and in some ways there's less movement to full recovery. The third slide depicts the course of individuals with bulimia nervosa, and what you can see here is that there is also quite a lot of movement, but again, a lot of movement before moving to full recovery, people are moving into the teal, they're moving into the partially recovered state. So in the next slide that I'm going to show you, I just want to walk through a little bit about what that partially recovered state means. So what I am showing you in this slide um, are First, I'll highlight the things in green, and then I'll highlight the things in yellow. The things in green represent the greatest probability of movement from time one, which is column one, to time two, which is any next um, window of time, any next three-month window of time. Patients with um, anorexia nervosa um, are most likely anorexia restricting type are most likely to move to the green, either to another full threshold illness, ANBP, 
or to subthreshold restriction type AM in any given three month window of time. Patients with binge purge type illness are most likely to move either to restricting type AM or to bulimia nervosa or to subthreshold AM BP over time. For individuals with bulimia nervosa, they're actually most likely within any given three month window of time to move to AMBP or to move to subthreshold AMBP or subthreshold BN or binge eating disorder or to no diagnosis. Now, the piece that I wanted to highlight is actually really movement from the subthreshold diagnoses. So that's what we've described as subthreshold ANR, subthreshold AMBP, subthreshold BN, purging disorder, and binge eating disorder. Um, there, the columns show you um, that individuals with those subthreshold diagnoses, save AM, subthreshold AMBP, um, are most likely to have as their next move, move to full recovery, move to no diagnosis. That's true for individuals with subthreshold AMR or subthreshold BN, for individuals with a diagnosis of purging disorder, for folks with binge eating disorder. And then, of course, stably for individuals who have no diagnosis, they're more likely to persist in that. So I mention it um, because it, it does feel important to think about the transition and what's actually happening for our individuals with eating disorders. We know that they usually don't go from a full threshold diagnosis straight to full recovery, and most likely they're likely to uh, experience a reduction in their own symptoms. So for individuals with ANR, they may gain a bit of weight before they reach full recovery. For individuals with BM, they may reduce their symptoms frequency from um, once weekly to maybe, let's say, once monthly, um, or to be able to stop the purging before stopping the binging, or vice versa, um, and that these feel like important things to be recognizing as potentially a progression of their illness before getting better. This next slide um, comes from uh, our colleague uh, Nassim Abu's data um, from our longitudinal study which show you that uh, the relationship, again, longitudinally, between behavioral symptoms of restrictive eating and compulsive exercise can also be related to um, weight and shape concerns, as well as overvaluation of weight and shape. In this slide, we're looking at time one, which is restrictive eating and compulsive exercise, and then time two, um, overvaluation of shape and weight and shape and weight concerns. Um, as a relationship. So what we're looking at here is the ability of time one variables to predict what's happening in the next week. And I show this to you because what I think it suggests is that there is a reciprocal relationship. We know that overvaluation of weight and shape and shape and weight concerns can drive restrictive eating or engagement in compulsive exercise. But what our data show you as well is that restrictive eating and compulsive exercise can drive um, cognitions. So they can drive uh, overvaluation as well as shape and weight concerns. And so change in behaviors can also lead to change in beliefs, which is something that's consistent with the CBT model and may be important for us to remember as well in our patients that sometimes making change first in the behaviors um, will actually lead to um, some of the cognitive symptom changes as well. Another piece that I want to share, um, I've said to you that by long-term follow-up, the BMI for most individuals is within the normal range. What this shows you is that weight gain is actually variable. Um, where our patients are always terrified that they're going to gain weight exponentially over time, what we can do is begin to reassure them that actually for individuals with AN, they're the ones who are the most vulnerable to weight gain. And in fact, that's because they're most likely to need it. They're the ones who are presenting at a low weight, and they are actually most likely to gain weight during the course of treatment, engagement in treatment, um, but also over time. And that most of what happens um, in terms of predicting their long-term weight outcome happens within the first two years of their coming into our study. So they may gain weight in the beginning, again, because their weight is low and they need to gain weight, but then their weight will stabilize so that the greatest slope um, in prediction of uh, weight in our longitudinal sample of individuals AN and BN happened within the first two years of the study. 
So the final portion of what I want to talk about is how can we as clinicians and researchers do better by our patients? And here I want to share with you some quotes um, from some of my own patients um, who generously were willing to comment a little bit um, as individuals with really quite chronic eating disorders, um, either to share what has been helpful to them um, or what they wish clinicians out there knew um, for them as they've been working on getting better and, um, and then actually achieving recovery. So the first message I think is one of remain hopeful. Um, one of my individuals uh, who's in her 30s with uh, really chronic anorexia nervosa said, I wish my clinician would know how much I appreciate the endless support she offers me. I'm fully aware of how frustrating it is to work with this illness and the faith that she has in me is one of the reasons that I keep fighting. Even when I take 10 steps back, I want her to know that I want to get better. It's just exhausting to fight this every day, every minute, and every second of your life. The message I take from that, you know, knowing this, knowing this individual, um, is that the idea of being hopeful and holding hope for somebody who no longer has it is critical. Um, Trying not to give up on our patients, even when it's exhausting, even when it's frustrating, and even when it feels like they're making progress and then sliding back, actually does matter to patients. They need us to be hopeful, even when they don't have the hope themselves. The second um, is to be patient. Uh, another patient, another individual um, with uh, also uh, an even more chronic illness, you know, more than a 20 year illness, um, an individual who's really struggled with anorexia nervosa, but also with then pretty normal weight um, binging and purging illness, um, said, I would want clinicians to know how important patients, support, and reality checking are for recovery. Recovery can feel incredibly disheartening and impossible at times. But reminders that recovery happens helped me to remain hopeful. Also, even when it felt incredibly redundant to ask my clinician to help me reality check my fears and to challenge my distorted beliefs, I needed to hear it every single time. Hearing her healthy voice gently but firmly challenging my own thinking gave me permission and support to fight against my eating disorder until I was strong enough to believe and trust my own voice. So to me, um, this is a reminder, um, particularly with this young woman who um, in her 30s as well, has now actually done pretty well. Um, she's someone who I would, um, I would describe, and I think she would share this description, would describe herself as being in partial recovery. Um, you know, she's behaviorally remitted um, but her cognitions are still pretty strong, um, and her body image disturbance is still pretty strong. Uh, and so the idea of being patient with her, but also recognizing and reminding her that um, achievement of behavioral remission really is a prerequisite to achieving emotional cognition remission um, is helpful as rem a reminder to her. And I think often being the voice of reason um, when she doesn't have it, can be really helpful for her. And it, it sounds like that's been something that's been pretty instrumental. The third patient um, shares a little bit longer of a story, so I'll read it. Um, but I want to say, you know, the overarching message for her, to me, feels like pushing for full recovery. She said, when I started treatment, I couldn't leave my apartment. I was terrified of buying food and I would only go out late at night. My body felt foreign to me, like I was an alien with a shape only I could envision. I found cognitive behavioral therapy and gradual exposure to the things that made me uncomfortable to be helpful. I liked being able to slowly see myself conquer increasingly harder challenges. Knowing that my therapist believed in me was immensely helpful. It took a long time but I was eventually able to tolerate the things that terrified me. I'm doing well these days. I teach full-time, I've run two marathons, 
I can go to a restaurant without worrying about calories. I feel comfortable in my own skin. And for the first time, my life feels full. To keep myself healthy, I'd make sure to eat three meals a day. I think recovery is as much mental as it is physical. So I prioritize having a healthy work-life balance and I don't bite off more than I can chew. I challenge myself, but I'm also aware of my limits. When I begin to get stressed, I seek out something to counter it, like a yoga class. Once I truly believed that I was worthy of recovery, and everyone is worthy of recovery, health and happiness began to follow. Once your plate has no restrictions, your life opens up, and you slowly begin to do things you never imagined were possible. I would tell anyone who's ambivalent about seeking treatment that there's hope. It's also absolutely possible to recover and even thrive. It's scary and it won't be easy, but the more you help, the more help you allow yourself to get, the more your life will grow. And the freedom to live life without constant restrictions and fears about food is worth fighting for. Everything you want is on the other side of fear. I couldn't say it better than this young woman herself. Um, this is a young woman uh, who, again, had you know more than uh, roughly a 20-year course of illness um, and is now doing really well. Um, she is someone who certainly would never have believed that she could get better um, and would never have believed where her life could be now. Um, and I, I often hold her in my mind as I'm working with patients uh, you know, who are coming in with more chronic illnesses and who also can't imagine getting better um, to remind both myself and the patients um, that full recovery is possible. But we can still do better. So we know that empirically based treatments don't work for all. They definitely work for some, but they don't work for all. So some of the patients that I've described, um, well, actually all three of the most recent patients that I described, my own patients, you know, certainly I, I come, I'm coming in my work with them from a cognitive behavioral orientation and using CBT um, initially, and then often relying on CBT principles over time. Um, but these are folks who did not do well with a short course of illness, um, short course of treatment. While our data, our longitudinal data, show that most people improve, some patients don't fully recover, and a small subset will have a persistent eating disorder. I think the question is, are these folks that we would describe as having a severe and enduring illness? What is a severe and enduring illness? In the, in the field, some folks have defined or suggested that a definition of severe and enduring eating disorders um, are for folks who have had an illness for more than seven years. Our data, as well as our clinical experience, show that actually that would be unfair because more than half of these, particularly those with anorexia nervosa, even when they've been ill for seven years, will still go on to fully recover. So the question for me um, would be, you know, whether we may do our patients a disservice by characterizing them or their illnesses as severe and enduring. In some ways, it's validating to be able to say, you have had a really chronic illness and you have lost a lot of your life through this. But I think on the other hand, we want to be able to share with them that we are still hopeful that they can get better because the longitudinal data do bear this out, that the longer we can hang in there with our patients and for patients, you know, whether or not they're in treatment, um, it is likely that over a long time, they will continue to improve and many of them will continue to get better and recover. As a researcher, my strong push would be that we need more research to understand what promotes recovery for those with really treatment refractory illnesses. And I think on the flip side, to try and understand the biological predispositions that may make folks vulnerable to the much more chronic illnesses. Because even if we can be hopeful for them, and I think we should be that they will continue to get better, it still is a long time of being quite ill and a long time of really having missed a good portion of their lives. And whatever we can do to help them get better more quickly um, is what I'd like to be able to do. 
uh, our team here at the EDCRP at MGH is now really focused on um, integrating our longitudinal studies with neurobiological data collection. We have two studies ongoing right now, um, both of which are with young patients. So these are both with folks who are 10 to 22. Um, and part of, part of our thinking in this is that we know even for the patients who may end up with a more chronic eating disorder, that often their illness begins in adolescence. Not always, but often it begins in adolescence during a time of rapid brain development and growth. And um, studying the neurobiology of these illnesses, particularly during this window, may give us the strongest push for being able to understand really what's going on in terms of promoting recovery, as well as understanding those with the more chronic eating disorders. The two studies that um, I will just briefly share with you are an adolescent brain study in which we're looking at individuals with low weight eating disorders. These are females with low weight anorexia nervosa, ARFID, as well as other types of eating disorders. And then the second is called the CARE study, the Child and Adolescent Restrictive Eating Study, which is actually a study of ARFID, Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder. And this second, this CARE study, is a study of boys and girls with um, across the weight spectrum with ARFID. Both of these studies are neurobiological based studies, so we focus on studying um, the brain bases of these illnesses as well as looking at endocrine factors um, and other uh, behavioral factors that may be associated um, with the underpinnings of these illnesses. We're then following these folks for 18 months to two years to look at what happens in folks as their illnesses change and as many of them proceed to recovery. For more information about our ongoing research studies, um, I'm sharing with you the contact information for, two, um, for these two studies. Um, these are both uh, nurses who work with our project um, and their lovely contact information um, right here. I want to acknowledge that none of the work that I do would be possible without an enormous and amazing team of people, uh, including Jenny Thomas, who's right with me. I also want to acknowledge uh, my funding sources and again, apologize for the formatting issue and know that when you're emailing me, just add the U back up on my email address. And then finally, I want to acknowledge um, all of my patients who teach me every day in my clinical work. And thanks also to the countless participants who have generously offered their time and their stories in participating in our research studies. Um, thanks very much to all of you for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Eddie, for that truly informative presentation. Um, I'm always so impressed to hear you speak because not only do you have really interesting data to share, but it's clear how much you really care about your patients. We're going to turn on the video. <laughs> Hi, everyone. How um, weird. It's mirror image. I know. Reverse it. mirror image. <laughs> um, all right. So it's kind of like you're in Cameron's office with her to be chatting with her about her presentation. Um, so I wanted to start off the Q&A um, with a question that we have actually from the audience. <clears throat> so this question um, comes from uh, Nikita, um, and she's wondering, were there any individuals who felt recovered in terms of like their cognitions or their behaviors, um, but their weight was actually still below what we would think of as a, a healthy weight? Yeah. So it's a great question, um, and it's, um, you know, it's one that I'm, I'm actually glad you asked, um, because in some ways it's one of the most challenging, and it's one of the most challenging groups to try and explain. Um, so yes, actually there were, there were a, a good handful of people, um, and, and perhaps I can pull up the number, but there were um, a small subset of folks who had uh, initial diagnoses of anorexia nervosa, who um, were still at a BMI of less than 18.5, um, who were actually pretty much fully recovered. Um, and, you know, Truthfully, you know, we looked at these people really, really carefully. And so many of them, we actually made a decision, kind of an executive decision, um, that actually they still were not recovered because either their weight still was too low or the pattern of eating that, eating that they were describing um, really just didn't actually have a, a healthy flavor to it. Um, but there were actually some people whose BMIs were, you know, let's say 18 um, or thereabouts 
who were eating regularly and um, who really denied all weight and shape concerns and whom we did determine were well. Um, and so it's a smaller subset. And I know that in my work with my patients, um, you know, what I try to emphasize to them is weight recovery is part of recovery. It's not the only part of recovery, but it actually is a prerequisite for being well. You have to be at a healthy weight. You have to be able to eat well. Um, and uh, perhaps those two things are different, but they feel pretty related. Um, so there were a small group, I, I think in short, there were a small subset of people whom we did decide um, were at a healthy were at a a healthy weight, but at a low healthy weight, you know, the lower end of normal, um, who we did describe as being recovered. Mm. Yeah. Well, Complicated. Yeah, tricky, tricky. Well, um, actually, this question um, reminds me a little bit of the, something that you talked about yeah. on the team before. I think you know I know where, where you're going. Really I'm, I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> but I'm wondering about recovery from ARFID yeah. and how you might define that. So you talked a lot about definitions that obviously are in DSM-5 about recovery from AN and BN. Um, but obviously, you know, having developed this new treatment for ARFID, you must be thinking quite a bit about how do you know when someone's recovered from ARFID. Absolutely. And I think particularly when that, you know, there's a young person maybe who's been at a low weight for their entire life. Right. What kind of thoughts do you have about that? Yeah, so I, I definitely know, you, you know, we think about this all the time. Um, it, it's really challenging. And I think uh, I'll go into the ARFID piece in just a second, but even just bigger picture, it feels like these are really challenging illnesses to describe recovery from. I think our patients um, have a kind of magical thinking that they're going to be better and they won't have any weight and shape concerns, you know, and that they won't, um, you know, ever uh, sort of use use food for emotional reasons, similar to one of the people I described in the beginning. Um, and I'm not sure that that's actually a realistic definition of recovery. Um, it, it certainly may be true for some people, but it also seems like a good number of people um, are well and may still have some sort of normative shape and weight mm -hmm. concerns. For folks with ARFID, you know, we're, they don't have weight and shape concerns almost by definition, um, but they also may, um, you know, many of them, like our, you know, few people who are recovered and maybe at a BMI of 18, they may have been folks who were always at a really low weight. You know, they may be people who were um, coming into us at the first percentile, but pre-morbidly had been at the fifth percentile. And so trying to help them weight restore to the fifth percentile um, actually may be a healthy healthy outcome for them. But I actually wonder if part of what you're wondering about as well is about things like reliance on supplements. Um, so in, uh, in, you know, in the definition of ARFID, one of the things that defines the criteria um, is perhaps relying on supplements for being, uh, needing reliance on nutrition supplements or being vitamin deficient. And so it's a question I think that you and I ask ourselves in defining recovery from ARFID. Do folks have to be, um, they don't have to be foodies. We don't have the expectation that they're going to be eating everything That's under the sun. <laughs> right. Although you never know. Some will be. Um, but they don't have to necessarily be eating everything. Um, but we do want them to be eating and getting most of their nutrition from the full range of food groups. Um, and so, you know, I think actually I would just, I would no longer give them ARFID if they're taking a multivitamin. Um, the a lot of people probably do. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, it's similar to the idea that you know people who don't have eating disorders may sometimes think about their weight and shape, or may sometimes wish that they could lose five pounds. Um, those are not things that would mean somebody has an eating disorder. Likewise, somebody who's still taking a multivitamin may not have ARFID. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the ones that are more blurry are things like uh, still drinking Boost or still mm -hmm. drinking Ensure. Um, as a way of getting calories up for the folks who uh, you know, may still be low weight or working on weight restoration in ARFID. Right. And I know sometimes that comes up in our work yeah. when we're actually prescribing supplements yeah. to try to help kids to gain weight. Absolutely. Are we actually contributing to them still meeting criteria right. at the end of the treatment? Right. And I think we are. So I think part <laughs> of it is, you know, it's a tool. It's a tool to help people get on their way. Um, but, you know, what happens during the course of treatment, you know, we hope will not actually be true by the time that they're ready to end. So, thanks. We have another question, let's see, from um, Hillary Warner. 
Um, so Hillary's wondering, uh, when you talked about being patient, uh, you said being the voice of reason is important, and um, something I missed about reminding them that achieving blank is essential for blank. It's like recovery mad libs here. From wow, Hillary. I know. It's so fun. <laughs> I wonder what I could have said. Um, do you think Shall I go about... back to the quote? Let me take a quick yeah. peek, actually, and see if it was actually something that the patient herself said or if it was something that I said. I wonder if it might have been about... Uh, achieving behavioral remission being essential for cognition gains. Yeah, so I definitely might have said that because that mm -hmm. I do believe. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, one of the things that we know just in terms of the course of eating disorders, um, both from our own longitudinal data as well as from others, is that um, behavioral remission actually does usually precede cognitive, cognitive remission. Um, you know, we, we know that although it's not easy, um, many of our patients will um, uh, either weight restore um, or be able to interrupt the binge purge cycle, but actually still not be well. And what I say to people is that, you know, if you're waiting for, um, if you're waiting to, you know, not be scared of gaining weight, or if you're waiting to not care about your weight and shape in order to make the behavioral change, you know, unfortunately, like we're going to be stuck here forever because, those things um, they can't be the they can't be um, the gate to um, actually making behavioral change. Instead, you need to work on doing the behavioral change. You kind of need to work on just jumping in, um, and in some ways, kind of trusting your clinician or trusting the people that you're working with um, that it's something new to try. You know, many ways often people have with anorexia or with bulimia have never. <laughs> Excuse me. Someone else has a question. <laughs> um, but I was going to say, in many ways, you know, these might be folks who have never tried being at a healthy weight or who have never tried since onset in their eating disorder, stopping, binging, or purging. And it can be terrifying to do it. But we're asking them to do it as an experiment to see how it feels, to try it on, because it's something that they haven't tried. And where they are right now, it's just not working for them anymore. It's either really costing them their health or it's also costing them their life and their well-being. And so um, it's sort of asking them to jump in with being able to do behavioral change with the expectation and the hope that um, some of their thoughts and their beliefs will actually begin to shift over time, partly because hopefully they'll be somewhat internalizing the voice of, of us as reason, um, but, but partly because actually just with lived experience, they will start to care a little bit less about weight and shape. These things will become a bit less important as their worlds open up as well. Great. Well, another question that I have, you know, I mentioned a lot of our colleagues um, joining us or who will be joining us in the future when this is online will be clinicians, people sure. who are working um, with patients every day. And I was wondering um, about how you use some of these findings in their clinical practice. You talked about kind of general principles like maybe the clinician having in mind um, to be holding hope and that people will recover. But do you ever actually show any of these graphs to patients? Um, I'm thinking maybe about the weight graph or the mm -hmm. crossover graph. Um, or share with them the findings to maybe challenge some of the um, maladaptive thinking that they have, either being hopeless about recovery or yeah. the way that they'll gain a lot of weight. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. No, all three of those points. So, um, yeah, and maybe the easiest one is the last one. So mm -hmm. the idea of recovery, um, there's no question that I share the recovery data with patients. Um, trying to be you know, sort of mindful of the fact that, um, you know, especially the people who have more chronic eating disorders may feel really hopeless um, that they're going to get better. Um, and part of what I want to share with them is actually that most people really will get better over time and that even when progress is slow or even when they've been at this for quite a long time, that they can still get better. So that's a message I give pretty universally. Um, the second one, the idea of the weight outcomes. Um, so these are newer data, right, that come from our um, a, a former, um, now a student at Drexel, Helen Murray, um, who was a wonderful colleague, and um, put together these data really documenting the long-term weight outcomes of our sample. This is actually enormously helpful, right, because from a realistic standpoint, our patients come into us and they're terrified that if they make X, Y, or Z change that they will gain weight, um, which in some ways we want them to but they are terrified that they will gain weight and then begin exponentially, um, have it continue in that way, that they'll gain and that they won't be able to stop gaining. So I find that sharing these outcomes data is really helpful, and um, it, it, both sharing the long-term outcome data, but as well as um, sharing a little bit more about what happens
happens early on in the study where the expectation is that for people who are the, the lowest of weight, they are the ones that will begin to gain weight and part, you know, larger because they really need to be gaining weight. But for the people who are at a more normal weight um, from the beginning, you know, that their weight um, outcome is still going to be most likely within the normal range and that the trajectory is actually relatively flat. The third piece, um, you know, comes from the crossover data and third being the first one that you mentioned. Um, so, you know, for anybody who knows me, I'm pretty obsessed with crossovering. I don't talk about it all the time, so She's I certainly bring it up um, in my clinical work. work. <laughs> um, but I, I do. So I think a lot about diagnostic crossover, you know, partly because, um, you know, I think in some ways our, our patients um, kind of long for the days when they were restricting in anorexia, you know, that that was sort of a perfect time, you know, they were able to be underweight and they, they just weren't eating. Um, whereas um, we really might idealize that time. Yeah, that's the best way to say it. They idealize that time, um, again, perhaps forgetting that they were really, really unwell and also usually really miserable during those windows of time. Um, and so part of what I do in showing the longitudinal um, trajectory maps is to say, you know, this is what most folks who have an eating disorders course will look like. Most people who present with restriction type illnesses, particularly over time, will develop binge and purging. It's actually just kind of a natural part of the eating disorder. Mm -hmm. We know that, um, you know, for people, especially people with you know, long-term AN, it actually is really hard to gain weight. And for all of us as clinicians working with these patients, we know it's actually really hard to gain weight. They're terrified they're going to do it, but it's actually really hard to do. And um, binge eating is something that in some ways makes a lot of adaptive sense. They've been starving their body for a long time. And when the reins are off, they may be much more vulnerable to eat um, and overeat. And in some ways, the overeating may be something that's adaptive and definitely may be something that's actually just par for the course in terms of getting better. So when I show those maps and I show the progression from restricting type illness to binge purge type illness, I then show that it still often moves either to a sub-threshold illness and then on to fully recovery, because that is actually the most likely course of illness. And I do that kind of across the board in my course. Yeah. I show them a lot of the graphs, too. I'm glad that we're, we're doing the same. Yeah. yeah. I do say, I mean, one other thing, and I, I always like to emphasize this, I think, especially with a clinical audience, is that when we're working with these patients, you know, particularly in the, the BN graph, what you'll remember is that Many of the people, even who come in to us for thinning, have a bad history of AN. And what we know is that if folks have ever been at a low weight, they are still vulnerable to relapse into a low weight. And so assessing for historic AN, um, particularly when it's something that increases risk for mortality, feels critical. Assessing for suicidality feels critical. Um, and assessing for substance use disorders in these patients feels critical. Great. You know, I imagine another audience for uh, the webinar might be students or, or folks who are thinking about having a research career. Sure. And um, one question that comes to mind to me about the longitudinal study, you know, the folks who are thinking about maybe going into this area of research, yeah. talk about severe and acute AN, being yeah. such an important area. How do you keep participants um, in a study for 22 years? Well, it's such <laughs> a great question. So I will say that, um, you know, it's, it's really hard. So one of the things that is pretty remarkable is that this cohort really was enormously well maintained. So about 77% of our folks participated in the 22 year follow up study, which is pretty unheard of actually. Um, it's certainly unheard of here in the States um, where we, you know, our people moved all over the country. So many people, you know, they were recruited initially within Boston, um, but then people moved across the country and people moved outside of so within the first um, within the first ten years of the study, people were contacted really regularly. Every year, they received a newsletter about what was going on in the study, with information about some of the newer publications and some of our new findings. Um, and then, uh, and they were of course being interviewed very regularly within the first group. Over the next ten to fifteen years, when we were not funded by the NIH to continue the follow up it was more challenging to figure out how best to keep in touch with these patients, uh, people, I should say, because they weren't all patients. The way that we did that was, um, again, through regular mailings and newsletters, um, and also by um, actually pretty regular phone calls. So every year, we would update the database and make sure that we were on track with um, knowing where folks were. 
and partly because you know on the, the flip side the sort of more sobering piece is that we are also assessing for mortality and so um, one of the things that you know we want to routinely make sure that we know where our participants are and that we're able to reach them um, and we also want to make sure that they're alive um, and so we were able to do that pretty well and I think you know it's both a testament to it was a fantastic research team over the years but I also think it's a testament to these patients. So for anybody who works with patients with eating disorders, I mean, one of the things that we know is that um, these are often people who are really passionate. They're, they're, they're good people. And um, they also are quite invested in um, maybe protecting other people from being vulnerable to eating disorders um, and giving back. I mean, I think one of the, the sad things about having an eating disorder is that it costs so much in every way um, and I think people, um, you know, some, one of the, some of the things we've heard from our participants is that because they've had this terrible experience, they really do want to keep people from having it, and they want us to be able to learn what we can from them, and they do that by sharing their story. So I think that, um, you know, this cohort in particular was quite invested in it. I would say, you know, on the, the, the challenge in that, what we're finding right now, um, I don't know if this is where you were going or not, but in some of the work that we're doing with some of the adolescents, we're finding that um, a different kind of seems to be true. So adolescents also are passionate and interested in participating in research and do, but again, many of them will get well, and many of them get well early on. And one of the things as researchers that we're now finding that is challenging is that for many of the young folks, when they get better, they don't want to talk about it anymore. And um, it has actually already been a little bit harder to learn more about the people as they get well, um, in part because some of them are dropping out. So I think, you know, for me, it feels so critical that we have this longitudinal cohort, and I hope that, you know, we're able to continue to build on that with our um, with our younger patients, um, because especially for the young ones, you know, and their families too, um, we want to understand what helps people to get better. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's actually a great note to, to wrap up, okay. a lot of hope and future research ideas. Um, so thank you again, Dr. Eddie Cameron, for a wonderful presentation. Um, just as a reminder, um, for anyone watching, our next webinar is scheduled for December 12th at 8 a.m. Eastern Time, and the presenter will be um, Anne Kathy Biasetti, who will be discussing the topic of therapeutic restorative yoga as an adjunct treatment and recovery. Um, just think it's apropos, one of your patients have actually talked about like, using yoga yep. as a skill. Um, so you can find out more about this and other upcoming webinars by visiting the website, aedweb.org, and clicking on the Education tab. Um, thank you guys all so much for participating. Thank you, uh, Cameron, for your wonderful presentation, and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Okay, thank you Bye. so much.